Good morning. Uh, we're very happy to have Ruben Östlund here with us today. Uh, a Swedish director you probably have heard about. He just won a big award uh, last May in a festival called the Cannes Film Festival with his latest film, The Square. So he's here to present that film and also a whole retrospective of his work so far. And uh, I would like you to welcome him uh, to Thessaloniki. So it's your first time here, Ruben, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And how do you make it? What do you make of it so far? Uh, we were walking a little bit in the harbor uh, last night, and then, and then we had dinner with you. So that's what I've been <laughs> doing. <laughs> well, actually, yesterday at dinner, Eric was telling me how you grew up in... Uh, you, you were born in a, this tiny island outside of uh, Göteborg, and it's very flat, and it rarely sees any snow. Still, you were fascinated with ski and skiing films, and you started by making these ski films. So this strikes me uh, as a bit of a paradox, and I was wondering what other kind of paradoxes shaped your career as a filmmaker or as a person, maybe. Uh, well, uh, I think one of the, the reasons that I was interested in skiing was because my mother came from far north in Sweden, and every winter we were spending our win uh, like the winter semester, uh, the winter holiday or the Christmas holiday there. Uh, so maybe that's the reason. But I mean, I think that I was thinking yes, yesterday we, when we talked about an island, and uh, uh, that was interesting with an island. You know that growing up on an island, the limitations are so clear. Uh, you know, you you know exactly where you can go and what play areas you have. It was a, it was very very limited in a very inspiring way. I think so. Maybe that's also. Maybe it have uh, inspired a little bit the way of working, you know, to have a little bit of formalistic idea or an aesthetical idea that you make as a limitation in order to create energy. Uh, I haven't used that that much in the last films, but in, in the in the earlier ones, then I was more you know, formalistic in a way. And yeah, and maybe in a way, being in a small place, it, it didn't it wasn't such a big island, right? Uh -huh. Maybe it it made you keen to. Uh, observe people and uh, see what they do in their everyday life and something that you use in your phones you are a keen observer of the human behavior I would say but I think it's much about um, I think it's a little bit about my parents because my mother she was a teacher and my father was a teacher and my mother was really interested in sociology uh, and I remember um, one thing that she told me you know, there's a sociological experiment that is called the Solomon Ash uh, uh, conformity experiment, when you have someone pointing on lines, and uh, uh, you take one individual that is like the test person, and you ask them which line is the longest one, and they are comparing two lines. And then the group uh, are saying the complete opposite. They say that the shortest line is the longest line, and it's a way of showing that you are conforming to the group. And I remember that my mother was talking about this experiment, that she did this experiment with her third grade uh, students, her third grade pupils. And that also became seen in involuntary. Uh, so I think I had parents that were interested in putting things into a context. Uh, and both of them were very politically interested. And my father was a teacher in economics. So, and I think, um, uh, yeah, they always put things into into a context, I guess. And then at one point you made a movie out of them, right? Yes, <laughs> I made a, co a film called Family Again, a documentary film where uh, uh, they had been divorced for 23 years. And then it was my graduation film from the film school at the university. And uh, during the film school, I only had been doing documentaries. That was, the, uh, I didn't do any fiction films on a small, uh, how do you say, uh, examination, but, but, but basically only documentaries. And one documentary that had a very, very clear setup, that I love clear setups. It was uh, bringing them back in front of the camera 23 years after their divorce, and both of them are singles again. So it was a little bit okay to see, you know, will they go together again? And, and I, I asked them to compare their version of, their, uh, of, their, uh, of the divorce. And it was, uh, it was very generous of them. They did this, um, uh, and I think they were curious themselves also to see what, what, what came up. The camera become like some third part watching us. So it was possible for me to, to make that set up. And it was also possi possible for them to do this because of the camera's uh, presence. And um, 
um, yeah. But when you were making those documentaries, were you really uh, thinking of capturing reality or manipulating reality or making things happen? Were you hoping that your parents would get together again because of that film, maybe? I don't know. I thought I just thought it was a good setup, you know, almost like a romantic comedy. Uh, the way that we are watch watching the dramaturgy in a romantic comedy is that will they get each other or like what will happen? So it's a good setup for it. But no, I think I was more interested in since I, I was brought up with my mother. I was interested in l uh, hearing my father's version in front of my mother. Uh, so I thought it was a way of doing doing that. But I think that you know I. Since I started with ski filmmaking, I have never really been interested in film history. I, nev I have never been a cineast. I have not watched that many uh, 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 films before I went to film school. Then, of course, uh, during the education, I had to watch some classics. But uh, for me, it was always the video camera and the possibility to capture a moment with the video camera. Um, and uh, when we were filming the skiing, then the setup is super, super clear. You're going out and filming something together with the skiers when they are trying to do something that is impressive or spectacular or, you know, and then we are capturing that with the video camera. So it's a very, very, yeah, it, it's a limited but still very free way of, of trying to use the moving images. Mm -hmm. uh, and the same thing I felt when I was doing the, the documentaries, you know, you want, you want to capture a, a, a very unique moment. And um, I think that that is still something that I'm trying to do when I'm making the, the feature films. It's about creating a setup when the unique moment can happen, you know? And that's the moment that we have to, to save mm -hmm. uh, and bring into the editing. Um, yeah. Uh, yesterday you, you were here for the presentation of, and the Q&A for the Guitar Mongoloid, your first uh, fiction feature. And uh, you said that it was made with a lot of anger and an attitude that I will show you, I will show you how it's done. Yeah. Um, could you talk about uh, making that film and those years and what happens to that uh, energy when you are established and you win the Golden Palm? <laughs> Well, we, we were making, we were, we were joking a little bit about this because in the beginning you're like, you want to show these bastards, you know, and you want to conquer a space in the Swedish film industry. You're like, you, you, you want to be a film director, you want to do these things. But then the more established you get, then that energy is exchanged to uh, scared of losing your position. <laughs> so it's a, then there are other other ones that want to push you off, you know, and, and but that also creates a kind of energy to it. But um, I mean, I think that um, uh, we were lucky because when we were in film school, then the DV camera came, the small digital video camera. And it was actually the first time that the digital technology became good enough uh, to start shooting f fiction. At least the, the industry uh, um, changed their mind when it came to DV, very much because of dogma with the Danish dogma and Lars von Trier. So, so that, that of course gave us a possibility to shoot things without having this big production uh, uh, model. Or So uh, that gave a lot of in energy too. Uh, but um, yeah, and I think that the, the kind of attitude, you know, that you know, you, you want to do something, you want to create something, and you have, you, you, I think it's very dependent on one, what kind of group you are, are connected to, and if you can create a group where you can create that entity. Um, and I think there was a couple of people around me and Eric and Kalle Boman that was on the school that, where we managed to, you know, build up that entity. Um, and that was, of course, an important part of when it, when it comes to the approach with the, the, the guitar bungalow. But what I think is mo mo more important is the attitude to moving images. And, I, I'm, and um, when, when I made the guitar mongoloid, then there were uh, critics that said, this is not a movie. And they, actually, they said, this is not a film. And I mean, film is a word that is describing the technique, and it was actually a 35 millimeter print, so they were using the word in the wrong way. They, they put a lot of convention into the word. And, uh, uh, but if you talk about moving images, then you are more free from the expectations of what a movie should be or what a film should be. So there was a starting point where I enjoyed much more talking about moving images. That's what we're dealing with than, than, 
than, than making movies. And, um, and, and in order to, to show you which one of the best moving images that I know, I, I was uh, bringing a, a, a clip from YouTube to you. Because I think that um, one thing that we have to do, you know, as directors is also to compare us with uh, the best moving images that we find on YouTube. Um, and um, I think it's a quite good starting point of a discussion, actually. So you, you, but this is a clip called... Um, and what's so great with this clip is that I can tell you what it is before and you will still enjoy it when you see it. It's called uh, a Cab Driver on the BBC. I don't know if anyone has seen it. Uh, it's a taxi driver that my, by mistake ends up in a live broadcast news program on BBC. And the journalist thinks he's an expert on internet rights. And uh, I, I think that you should watch on the moment when he decides, because he decides to play the role of the internet expert. Uh, and it's a fantastic moment when he's trying to avoid losing his face and starts to play this character that says so much about us human beings. We can watch it. We can watch it many times, I think. What does it mean for the industry and the growth of music online? Well, Guy Cuny is the editor of the technology website uh, News Wireless. Hello, good morning to you. Good morning. Were you surprised by this uh, verdict today? I'm very surprised to see this verdict to, to come on me because I was not expecting that. When I came, uh, they told me something else, and I'm coming. You got an interview there, so it's a big surprise anyway. A big surprise. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, with regards to uh, the cost that's in, in, involved, um, do you think uh, now more people will be downloading online? Uh, actually, if you can go everywhere, you're going you're gonna to see a lot of people downloading uh, to the internet uh, and the website, uh, everything they want. But I think uh, it's is much better for the development and uh, to improve people what uh, they want and to get uh, on the easy way and so fast uh, the things they're looking for. This does really seem to be the way the music industry is progressing now, that people want to go onto the website and download music. Exactly. You can go everywhere on the cyber cafe and you can check. Uh, you can go easy. It's going to be very easy way for everyone uh, to get something uh, to the internet. Thank you, Lee. Thanks very much indeed. I think we can uh, now also speak to uh, Rob Pitton. We can watch the moment again when he decides to play the character of this internet expert because I think it's the industry and the growth of music online. Well, Guy Cuny is the editor of the technology website uh, News Wireless. Hello, good morning to you. Good morning. Were you surprised by the. Uh, but, but what's so beautiful with this clip, uh, I think, is something that is completely different from the kind of s conventional storytelling that is in feature films. That, uh, I mean, that this moment in itself says so much about how we are role-playing creatures, that we actually are ad adapting to a role and playing a role. And right now we are playing the role as the director and, and, and the yeah, the interviewer. And, <laughs> Uh, the expectations on who we should be also is like the limitation for us in the idea about ourselves, And how this guy then uh, uh, starts to imitate the, the internet expert. And uh, uh, that the journalist is uh, so obsessed also with letting these, how do you say, this ritual of being in, an, in a news program. She's so obsessed that it will be without any uh, interruptions. So. Even if he's saying nonsense, you just still want the, the show to uh, keep on running. And I, I, I think this is a very interesting clip to have if you want to detect that you actually are not talking about something interesting. You're only, uh, how to say, uh, keeping up to a convention. And, and, uh, and I think that one thing that we do on platform is that we send a lot of these clips uh, back and forward to each other where we think that, ah, have you seen this clip? This is fantastic. Uh, 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 because it really, really points out the, 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 the ability of, of moving images to capture certain, certain moments that tells us something about um, uh, what it is to be a human being and, um, in a different way than the storytelling is doing. Mm -hmm. You spoke about losing face, and this is a prime example of that, of not wanting to lose face. And this is, a, in a way, a common theme in uh, most of your films. Uh, so how do you 
recreate something so unique and uh, funny and uh, true to in cinematic terms? How do you start from a point and make a movie around it? I, I think I never managed to create uh, uh, such a beautiful face that he's doing in that, even if I tried many times. But for I, I, one thing that I think that I do is that I remember a lot of stories that people have told me. And, uh, and one story for, that is a good example that is showing out, uh, pointing out a kind of situation that is very useful when it comes to making movies is one from involuntary. Uh, involuntary, there are five different stories when people are uh, trying to avoid losing face in front of their group, so to speak. And it's, um, it was a friend of mine that told me that he was going on a bus ride down to the Alps to, to go to the French Alps and skiing. And uh, um, they were on this bus ride, he, after like a couple of hours, he goes to the toilet. And when he's in the toilet, uh, the bus, like, go, it's like, how do you say it? Like, um, makes a turn, so he loses his uh, balance. So he uh, grabs the curtain in the toilet. It's a small, small, small curtain. So he breaks that curtain. Uh, and he tries to put it up again, but he doesn't manage. But he doesn't think that much about it. It's not a big deal. And the bus uh, journey continues. And then they stop at Raststete. Uh, you know, everybody goes out to eat something. <clears throat> and when they're coming back into the bus, the bus driver is really upset. And, uh, but he's aiming towards a group of youngsters in the back of the bus. So it's a little bit unclear what have happened. And after a while, it comes, uh, he, my friend realizes, ah, he's talking about the curtain. And he's like, you know, should I say something? What should I do? Uh, um, but uh, after a while, he just decides, okay, the, we will. This will be over in 30 seconds or so. And when the bus driver is finished talking to the youngsters, he goes back to sit behind the wheels. But instead of driving, he turns off the bus, and he takes the microphone and he says, uh, okay, actually, I don't. I won't go anywhere before the one that did this confesses. And the thing is, it's a little bit too far in between when he actually said it was the curtain and until this moment, so it's already embarrassing. And, uh, uh, but I love that dilemma, you know, that you, you have two choices, but none of them are easy. And both of them will have consequences. You know, it will be hard to say, ah, I'm sorry, it was me. Come on, why didn't you say anything before? Uh, and it will also be very hard to not say anything. But what my friend did was he, wa he was not saying anything. <laughs> uh, so suddenly they are sitting there in the bus and, and no one is moving and the bus driver is really upset. And, uh, uh, you know, it's a, like, a, how do you say, a status quo, like a really, really um, an embarrassing situation where no one's really knowing how to deal with it. And the further it goes, the harder it will be for him to confess also, of course. And that, that kind of situation, I mean, is I think there's a reason by why I remember it. I, I, mean, I mean, he told it to me maybe when I was 15, 16 years old or something. And these kind of situations, I think that it's, it's kind of the same thing as stand-up comedy. Uh, you know, that you know someone have told you about a, a dilemma, a very interesting setup. And there's a reason why you remember it, because it touches something in you. And you have to, you have to also believe that that will touch someone else or that you can use it in that way. So. Uh, a lot of the situations that are in the film are things that people have told me uh, that have, have happened to myself uh, that is uh, like have that kind of stand-up comedy quality to it. And this story that you just uh, told us, it, it found its way in Involuntary almost exactly with a different character. So has your friend... Uh, if you're still in contact with him, <laughs> did he have a comment on you putting his uh, awkward moment up there for all the world to see? Um, I actually don't remember if I have told him, but uh, uh, I, I mean, there's so many much more embarrassing scenes that I have used in my films that have happened to friends of mine. And uh, but, but I can tell you what happened to I, I, in in the film. Then uh, I made it really, really harsh for that character because it, it, finally there's a little boy that has Down syndrome that is coming together with her, his parents up to the bus driver or, or to the guide in the bus and say, maybe it was him that broke the curtain. And she, was sit she the main character, is sitting just next to this and, you know, feeling really, really bad. 
But for my friend, it was actually, there was one of the youngsters that had fallen asleep towards the window because he was so drunk. And then after a while, the friends go, maybe it was him that broke the curtain, you know. And uh, they are waking him up and they're like asking him, was it you? I don't know, yeah, sure, I don't know, you know. <laughs> so he, he got saved. Um, uh, but um, uh, yeah, th there, are, there are definitely scenes that are harsher for uh, so more uh, the, the condom scene, for an example, in yes. the square. Yeah, this, yeah. That's a truth. It happened to someone you know as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you have seen it, but there's a, it's, a, it's a very delicate, um, interesting scene. Um, I can tell you about the setup for you that haven't seen it. It's a, a friend of mine, he follows like a, a woman home, uh, like a one night stand thing. And, uh, uh, oh, this is delicate. <laughs> it's easy to make a film scene about it. No, but then um, they are supposed to have sex. Uh, and uh, she, he's like going, oh, do you have a condom? And she's like, no, no, no condom. And he's like, yeah, I, I really think that we should have a condom. And she gets a little bit disappointed, okay, but she goes and gets a condom. They are at her place. And then they are having sex, and uh, uh, immediately when he have ejaculated, uh, she is like, whoop jumps up from the bed and goes, uh, uh, like points to the condom and said, I can take that. <laughs> and he goes, uh, no, 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 I threw it off myself. <laughs> and she goes, give it to me. <laughs> and, and he gets super paranoid and was like, no, no, I, I, I do it myself, I do it myself, I want to throw it out myself. And she says, okay, sure. She, she goes away and she comes back with a trash bin <laughs> and says, throw it away. And um, uh, uh, once again, a very delicate situation that have this dilemma in it, and that's also have this like stand-up comedy quality to it. Um, and when we had a premiere in Stockholm, actually he was bringing his new girlfriend to the screening, <laughs> and I, I said, have you told her that the condom scene is <laughs> something that you have experienced? <laughs> And uh, yeah, he had to tell her before the screening. So, yeah. but does it make it harder for you making films to keep up friendships? <laughs> I think everybody gets really flattered when one of the scenes end up in the film, finally. I have, I, yeah. Yeah. Especially if it's Kleist Bang and Elizabeth Moss. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Them, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you, you seem to, to love these awkward situations and you seem to invite people to think what would I do if it, this happened to me? And I was wondering, when you set up these moments, do you ask yourself the same thing? Do you have answers that um, w what you would do and how would you handle something like that? I mean, I think there's m many of the situations that you know what is the right thing to do. But what I really like is when I can push myself into a corner and I can identify with doing the wrong thing. And that, that is, once again, if you go to sociology as an as an subject, uh, it's very interesting sociology because it dares to look at human being when we fail. And it's not judging the individual when we are failing. It's rather more curious. Ah, now we are failing. How interesting. Uh, and can that sociology can use that example as something that you can use as a reference in your own life. And I think that I look at the situations in the same way I quite often get like stupid questions, I think, actually from a journalist that's asking me, why do you hate the main character so much? And why do you want to punish him? And why are you a sadist? And, and like that kind of uh, idea. And, and I have a very hard time to identify with that. But what I like is to make a trap for myself and uh, challenging myself, challenging my morale, challenging my ethics and, and uh, when would I fail to live up to my morale, to, 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 to the ideal, uh, so to speak? And that's, that's really the kind of questions that I think is interesting because it's, um, yeah, then you can get the knowledge out of, out of the situations. So why are you sadistic against your main character? I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> I actually think that you, uh, even though you, you put them in, into very difficult corners and very awkward situations. You, you, you handle them with a tenderness that it's really, you can see it. There's always humor in your films and there's always 
you know, I think it was Eric that said yesterday that from success you learn nothing, but when you fail, you learn a lot. So it's what you were talking about. Um, and so even though, yes, the, especially the, the character in the square, he goes from one bad situation to the other, there's always some tenderness in the way you portray these situations. Is it important for you to, to feel for him? Uh, no, that I feel, f I feel for him. Uh, I feel for him anyway. So, so, uh, but um, uh, I, I think it's important to to not judge uh, judge the characters. The, to, I, I think it's very important to put the characters into a context and understand that the context is is pushing their behavior or making they beha them behave in the way that they are behaving. And I would say that uh, that that comes with the the whole of my directing style o always. You know. As soon as, a, as an actor is starting to talk about, you know, I think that this character would do in that or this way, then I always get allergic. Then I was like, don't talk about the character. What would you do if you were in this situation? And for an example, if you then are playing a chief curator of a museum, then you have to learn a lot about uh, And when we then are trying out the scene, then I always ask the, 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 the actors, can you identify with the behavior? Uh, and if I'm sitting there behind a monitor and trying to look at the scene and I feel I can't identify with the behavior, then the scene is not working. But as soon as I think, ah, I would actually be able to do that too, then I identify with him. And of course, identification is to care about the, char the characters or at least care about the human being. And, and, um, um, and uh, that's also why the actor, one of the biggest responsibilities for the actor is to say, <clears throat> Wait a little bit now. I would not do like this. In, and then we can s change the setup so it's possible to do uh, what it says in the script to do. Um, From what, what I understand, you, you like working with actors and you also like to do many takes. Could you say a few words about how you go about um, uh, shooting a scene? Well, uh, then we do exactly like that. We have a setup of the scene. We have read the script. We, have, we, are, we are now trying to transform this paper product into a visual product. And then as soon as the camera is placed uh, on the set and we are looking at the image, new problems will occur. And uh, uh, since I have been shooting with a lot of the, my films with a single camera setup, and we are like taking the scene from one angle, and we are not going to cut in it, then I'm making a limitation for myself where it has to work on the set. And that is a really good way of shooting, even if I'm cutting more nowadays, because um, then you have to investigate the situation and look at it, and if it's not organical or if it's not authentic, then it f will fail immediately. So what we do is put up the camera and then try out the scene, um, and then they are quite freed actors. They are they have to go through the script, but they can take a long time to go through the script. But they are not, they they are not allowed to push the scene into the next uh, state, so to speak, if they don't feel it's possible. So they have to investigate the scene carefully, carefully, and they can take risks. Also, they can do things that is maybe a little bit stupid, uh, um, um, because if we don't like it, you just say no. But, take that away, and sometimes we find things that is brilliant. And then during the day we are doing take after take after take after take, and sculpturing the scene, and trying to find out the best way of telling this scene. And um, uh, hopefully we find a skeleton, you know, a very strict uh, pattern of how we should tell the scene. Uh, sometimes it takes a long time, and I would say that one thing that is with shooting, it's so much doubting and feeling, oh my god, this is so bad, how I'm going to survive this day. Uh, and and w quite often you find it, and suddenly it's there. And suddenly it's, oh, oh my god, I'm so happy. We have it here. And then you're starting to sculpture it, and you repeat. And then uh, uh, the, the scene is going like this. In the beginning it's really, really bad. And then it's getting better and better and better. Ah, oh, and you find something. And, and, and it's going really good. And then certainly it's a dip and it's going down. Oh no, what's happening, you know? <laughs> the actors are getting tired. And, uh, 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 but then you, you often are able to push that up again. And when you are on the peak, then it's quite efficient to take a break on one hour or so. And when you get back on set, you say, okay, everybody, five takes left. 
And these five takes, you do a countdown. So it's an, a way of pushing in energy into these uh, five last takes. And then it's four takes left. Come on now, everybody. And you're trying to create the feeling it's an important football game, and we have to win it together. And uh, um, very often, I'm using one of these last takes. The, the second last take, quite often, actually. Not the last one, but the second last take. <clears throat> and then it, when you are lucky with that uh, method, you can create something that feels organic as it happens for the first time, but still we are following a very uh, strict structure. And so, I, because I hate improvisation, when you feel that people are improvising uh, without a very strict structure. So I, I, even if I use improvisation during the shooting, I never want it to feel improvised. I want it to feel like there's something exact, it's something precise about it. It, it feels like you're, in a way, you're trying to tire the actor out of the actors and make them, I don't know, more uh, spontaneous or... Uh... Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I think it, it's quite much like that. And uh, some actors need it, some actors don't need it. And when it comes to, for example, Elizabeth Moss, that have been shooting so much on TV, and she only have five takes, uh, then her energy is to explode and do something really, really good from the beginning. And when she comes to my shooting, then she has to adjust herself and save energy, save energy, save energy, and then in the end of the day, explode. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but seriously, I can't understand how we have a production system when it comes to making movies that is based on doing five takes. So it's based on writing something in a script that we work on with a long, long, long time. And when we are starting to visualize it, don't we think we're going to meet some problems? Of course we will meet a problem. Of course we will meet a, a big, big difference between that written uh, literature and trying to make it into a visual product, uh, product. We have to have time on set. And I think that's something that, mm, since me and Eric have been working so much together, that was something that we started out with the first film, and it has been like the key for every single production that we have made. What should the production look like when we do this movie? What, what does this movie need? And for me, I have always had time on set has been one of the most important things. In The Square, we had 70 shooting days. Uh, and I don't average maybe 30 or something in Sweden, I would say. So twice the, twice the time. Uh, because I know so many directors and so many actors that are not satisfied when they are leaving set every day. They feel, ah, oh, we didn't have time enough to do. How can I accept a situation, a working situation, when they are not satisfied? And uh, people are adapting to an economical structure when it comes to production that is, is not even true, because our, our films doesn't cost more than. Than a, uh, than, a, than a normal feature film. It's just changing where we are putting the budget, where we are using the, the money. So. I was very surprised to hear the other day from a person who works with him that Michael Haneke, for instance, he storyboards every scene, even the camera angles and everything, and he's really precise of what he's doing when he's going. Uh, I wouldn't have expected that uh, from his films. But you obviously, it's something that you don't do. You don't have uh, an exact idea of what a scene will look like since you mentioned I that. say that I have definitely an exact idea, but that exact idea is in one way when it comes to the script, when you see it on, um, on set, then it will be in a different way. So, and in, in Force Majeure, then we did storyboard on many of the images in the film. And before we go to set, we also are, uh, have checked which camera angle we will use. Um, so, so I, I say the idea is very exact, but how to get to the idea is, of course, uh, something that you have to investigate. How do you get to exact that moment that you had in mind when you were writing the script? And it's not always about dialogue for me. Uh, it's about the feeling or like, um, yeah, it's, a, it's about a, a certain kind of awkwardness sometimes and how, we re how do we reach that awkward feeling? Um, 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 yeah. uh, you said you, uh, the square was 70 days of shooting, and I know that the first cut of the film was a very long film, like three hours or so, and then you cut it down for the uh, Cannes premiere, 
but there was also some editing after uh, the screening in Cannes, right, when it was released in Sweden. So how easy is it to have all this material and then throw away stuff that you probably like since you kept there at the beginning? I, I, the first version of the square was three hours and 42 minutes. So it was one hour that had to be cut down. Is that, is that much? I don't know. Is it much? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, it, but it's not like that there's a lot of scenes that have been cut out. But it have been, you know, many of the scenes that I've pushed in this is pushed even more in the editing. They are maybe three minutes longer or, um, and then I have to make them a little bit shorter. It's some of the scenes that have been cut out. Three scenes or something have been cut out. Uh, but um, uh, it's, it's super hard to do that, I think. It's, uh, of course, hard. And winning the Palm d'Or, how did it feel? Uh, we actually have, we, we haven't released it yet because we, we are a little bit scared of what Cannes Film Festival will say or <laughs> we, because we have made a YouTube uh, film that is called What It's Like to Win Palm d'Or. Uh, and it's it's hundred percent focused on the waiting for the call from the festival that they want you to come to the award ceremony. So you know the Sunday when the award ceremony is held, then if you you have a feeling maybe we will get an award, you know. But everybody is waiting for that call from the festival, uh, and we have filmed that that morning when we are sitting and waiting for that call. <laughs> Uh, and it, it's really, really, you, as soon as someone, the, the phone is ringing, it's like, okay, who was that? Oh, no, it was my mother. Or, uh, and then we get, like, someone, the press agent is calling us and saying, uh, no, still nothing. And, and we're getting really, really depressed. And then at a certain point, we get the call that we have 12 tickets to the award ceremony. And we get like so happy. We are like sitting on a small restaurant uh, uh, at the beach in Cannes. And then we like someone is tapping my shoulder and asking me from behind, did you get the call from the, from the festival? Then it's Fatih Akin, you know, that German director. <laughs> they are sitting just behind us when we are like, whoa, sharing. So, um, uh, yeah. Thank you very much for being here and for uh, doing this today. Thank you. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. Thank you.